Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour. Wherever you are and however you are tuning in, we are so glad you're here. Uh, we usually sing a new song every week, but this week we have two songs that are oldies and very, very much goodies. Um, the first song is Hymn 590, Trust and Obey, and that comes as a request from Tim and Teresa in Minnesota. Let's sing the first, third, and fifth verse of Hymn 590, Trust and Obey. song is another oldie and a very much goodie. Uh, hymn 530, It Is Well With My Soul. This comes as a request from Raina Blackwood in Miami, Florida. We'll sing the first, second, and third verse.
sounded wonderful. When Lord haste the day, when my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord will descend, even so it is well with my soul. Are you waiting for the day? Amen. If you have a special request, uh, be it an oldie or one of our new songs, please visit us at seccentral.org. Click on the contact us link. Tell us where you are from, and we'll be happy to sing any song that is uh, from in the hymnal with you in the coming Sabbaths. Our last song this morning comes from our topical index of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have reached the last song. Are you encouraged? I hope so. We've learned a lot of new songs. Uh, and this final one is hymn 270, O Holy Dove of God Descending. We'll sing all four verses, one, two, three, and four. Hymn 270. Father, this morning, please open our hearts as we open your word. Let your Holy Spirit descend on us and our speaker that we, by your words, by your truths that we study, may be changed and that we can truly live a life with you. We ask all these things in your name, Lord. Amen. Our lesson study this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Chris Buttery, our senior pastor at Sac Central Church. Thank you very much, and good morning to each one of you, and a happy Sabbath. It's good to see you, and uh, trust you are doing well. How exciting it is to come together to study God's Word, amen? Surely. And those that are joining us, we're glad that you are tuning in as well. And uh, as per usual, we have a special offer for you. It's offer number 21546. And um, it, don't forget to put the C in front of that. All you need to do is call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org and we'll be happy to get you uh, it's this presentation either in CD or DVD format. Let us know which one you want. Don't forget to include your name, your, um, uh, your address, and uh, we'll be happy to get that out to you. Uh, we're also very, very happy to hear from, uh, from you. We get, we're getting a, several notes in and uh, folk letting us know how they're enjoying the program. Um, of course, when you go to our website, saccentral.org, you click on the CSH banner, Central Study Hour banner, you can go in there and you can actually get the lesson study guide for this week, uh, or you can get the notes from this presentation. And some have been enjoying those notes. Um, this is Oswald Masunge. He's 50 years of age. He's from Lusaka, Zambia in Central Africa. And he says, I'm, uh, I've been, I enjoy your teachings, especially your Sabbath school lessons. 
and I like the way you teach the lessons and I follow them well with your notes. And so there, there's someone enjoying our notes. And uh, so don't forget to go to our website, click on that little link and you'll be able to get the notes. Well, we're back, in, uh, back into Jeremiah and trust you have your Bibles uh, open and your study guides available. And we're going into lesson number seven. And we're looking at several chapters here, or a couple of chapters here in the book of Jeremiah, and uh, primarily chapter 9 and 26, but we'll be uh, hopping around to different places as we usually do around here. Um, our scripture text, or our memory text, is Jeremiah 9.24, and uh, let's read it together. Let's read it from the lesson study guide. Uh, it's taken from the New King James Version, so let's read that together. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about those verses as we roll through our study here this morning. Question for you, what do you do if no one wants to listen to you? How does God feel when no one when people choose not to listen to Him. Through Jeremiah, God held out the incredible promise and possibility of repentance, but amazingly, Israel still didn't want to listen, still didn't want to heed. How much trouble could they have averted if, in fact, they had listened to the prophet's messages? A lot of trouble, I'm sure. Now, the question is, is it the same for us today? When we read the book of Jeremiah, we read about how the prophet was sent to the, to the ancient people of God, to ancient Israel. Is there any application for us today? Is there something that we can learn? Our first text that we're going to read here is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. And if you'd be so kind to read that for us, thank you. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written as for our admonition, warning instructions, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Thank you very much. So all these things, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, all these things talking about the Old Testament Scriptures were written for who? Now, in his day and age, he was referring to the church of his day, but also for all of us who, who are living in even right up through to the last days. So there's great lessons that we can learn from uh, this study and from the, uh, the experience of Jeremiah. So let's go right over to Sunday's lesson. Let him who boasts... Let him who boasts. We're in, Je in Jeremiah chapter 9. So if you'd turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 9, that would be great. Now, chapter 9 of Jeremiah really uh, is an extension of Jeremiah chapter 8. As a matter of fact, these, ch these chapters, 8 and 9, are a part of what is called the Temple Discourse, which is chapter 7 through 10 of Jeremiah. Chapter 7 through 10 of Jeremiah. When God told Jeremiah to go down to the court of the temple and there deliver a strong message to the priests that resided there and ministered there and also to the, the prophets, the prophets of God. And we come to understand that these were false prophets, right? And so Jeremiah was told to go down there with a message down to the, uh, the courts of the temple. That's why it's known as the temple discourse. And so from Jeremiah 7 through 10, you have this discourse. Chapter 8 is where, we, uh, where, you, where it picks up where Jeremiah warns, the, uh, warns Judah of the perils of false teachers. You can read that in verses 5, 6, 8, and 11. And also of impending judgment or coming judgment. He mentions that in verses 7, 10, 12 through 14, 16, and 17. You can just make a note of that. Then from verses 18 to 22 of chapter 8, we're in Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 to 22, the prophet begins to mourn. Mourn for his people because they have not availed themselves of the provisions that God has made for their recovery. And he mourns because of their very sad, very sad condition. Uh, they're worshipping idols, they're following after false gods, and it's a very sad condition. And so where that picks up from Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah 8, through, from 8 verses 18 to 22, continues on into Jeremiah chapter 9. And so we're going to pick it up there in verse 1. Notice the language. Jeremiah says, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Now, someone has suggested that these, uh, the language here is appropriately called the poetry of suffering. 
and um, because the, the, of the hopeless condition of Judah. And uh, that hopeless condition obviously touched the prophet's heart. He was a prophet who, who wasn't just giving a message and saying, okay, God's told me to say this, and so I'm going to tell you. And he was detached from the, the people. He was truly concerned about the condition of Judah at that time. And so the Bible says he wept bitterly. And this verse surely uh, is the source of the description that we've come to know Jeremiah by, the weeping prophet, the weeping prophet. Let's continue reading here. Let's look at verses 3 through 6. And like they like the bow. Now, these verses here that we're looking at, verses 18 to 22 of Jeremiah 8, and then Jeremiah chapter 1 and 2, talks about Jeremiah's mourning and weeping for the people. But these following verses talk about the condition of Israel. We just want to read a few of these, verses 3 through 6. They, and like the bow, they have bent their tongues for what? Lies. And they are not valiant for the truth on the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord." It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the indictment on the antediluvian world where the Bible says that evil was in their hearts continually. People went from evil to evil. This is among God's people. And they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone, has, how, everyone take heed to his neighbor and do not trust any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slander. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their, ties, their tongues rather to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity, your dwelling places in the midst of deceit, through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. What was one of the problems with the children of Israel? They were liars, and they, uh, they were deceitful, and they were uh, seeking to trip up their neighbors, and so Jeremiah cautions the people, don't even trust your neighbor, because they have evil in their hearts, and they only mean to do you harm. Don't, don't even believe them. Notice what it says there in verse 5, they weary themselves to commit iniquity weary themselves. What does that tell you? It tells you that they're just, their life is absorbed with doing their own thing, getting their own way, even if it means uh, defying God and His law and His promises, and even hurting some other people. They weary themselves. Wow, it's quite an indictment, isn't it? Now, not everyone had succumbed to these things. Not everyone had succumbed to idolatry and other abominable practices, but it was extremely pervasive at the time of Jeremiah. It was so bad that Jeremiah wanted to leave to a quiet place just like David in Psalms 55 verses 6 through 8, wished to escape the treachery of his, what he called his friends. As a matter of fact, David said he wanted to fly like a dove to get out of there. And that's what Jeremiah says in these verses here. He said, Lord, take me away, in verse 2, take me away to a quiet, solitary place away from all of this foolishness. You can read more about the condition of God's people in verses 12 through 14 and verses 25 and 26. So what was really the basis of the problems of the children of Judah? What was their problem? The basis of their sad condition was that they did not know or they did not acknowledge Him, that is the Lord. You see that in verse 3. Let's read that again the last part, and they do not what? They do not know me. They do not know me, uh, says the Lord. Uh, another way we could put that is that they did not acknowledge Him. They did not recognize that God was creator and their maker, you see, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Uh, when that happens, of course, what restraint is there on people's lives? What restraint is there? We read in verse 5, they weary themselves to commit iniquity, they just went from one sin to the next to the next. Probably didn't bother them too much because you know uh, when, uh, when you step outside the will of God and, you, um, and you, you get away with it and you think that just this one time won't be so bad, what happens to your conscience? What happens to the conscience? The conscience uh, doesn't speak so loudly the next time. We sear. The Bible talks about searing our conscience and, um, and, and doing harm to our conscience so that the next time we don't feel as guilty. And we don't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us um, like, like He would like to speak to us and like He would like for us to listen. They went from one thing to the next to the next. Uh, and then, according to verse 13, let's read that, they forsook God's law. Look at that. And the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it. Is it safe to violate God's law? Is it safe to uh, push back or ignore, defy you can add any adjective you want to God's law, those negative adjectives. No, it's not safe at all. 
I've shared this with you before. If you, if you defy the law of gravity, if you're outside of a plane or a winged aircraft, what's going to happen? If you defy the law, you're going to get hurt. And uh, it's not that God has made that arbitrary and said, I, wanted, I want this to happen because I want to make your lives miserable. That's not how it works. These are laws that God has set uh, in motion. Uh, and this is, these are the laws of the universe. Uh, when we talk about God's law, we're talking about His moral law, the very foundation of His government. And the question is, is there, does harm come to us if we break and defy His law? The answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Just like f- jumping off one of these roofs out here, thinking you might fly when you can't, you might do yourself some harm. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul, uh, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, says the wages of sin, which is breaking God's law, is death. Now, he's talking there of the second death, eternal death. And so it's certainly not safe to violate God's law. There are eternal consequences, and not just eternal consequences, but there are immediate consequences. Um, Can you imagine if you lied, you lived a life of lying to people, breaking, what commandment is that one? Is that the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness? Did I get that right, the ninth one? Thou shalt not bear false witness? If you live a life of constantly lying, what type of of life are you going to have? Yeah, it's not going to be. It's not going to be happy, is it? You, sometimes you're going to be looking over your shoulder to see if someone that you've said a, a lie to is around, so that you don't, when you're talking to this person and lying to them and speaking out of both sides of your mouth, it, it's going to be miserable. And we could go down the list. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How miserable a person's life is who is breaking their marriage vows, looking over their shoulder, always paranoid, breaking the family, breaking up the, uh, destroying families and lives the children uh, cop at the worst. So it's not good to forsake God's law. And that was the problem with Judah. They were like, according to verse 26, let's read this together. Verse 26, Egypt, Judah, Edom. Now, who are these nations? Egypt and Edom and Ammon and Moab. These are the, 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 the nations surrounding Judah. These are uh, uh, pagan nations, essentially, worshippers of, of false gods. And who is included in that list? Judah. Judah, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness, for all these nations are uncircumcised. Now, of course, uh, the, the men of Israel were circumcised, but notice, and all the house of Israel are what? Uncircumcised where? Of heart. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that they're recalcitrant. They don't have humble hearts, contrite hearts. When, when God, through His prophet, appeals to them, they don't want to listen. They don't want to hear. Uh, they're, not going to, they're not inclined to humble their hearts and say, okay, God, we'll do as you please. We'll do what you're asking us to do. Instead, they, uh, in other parts of the Bible, they talk about st- st- stiffening the heart. or They, had, they were a stiff-necked nation. Um, Stephen, uh, the deacon of the early uh, New Testament church, um, mentioned that about the, the religious leaders of his day, that they were stiff-necked, um, hardened hearts, uncircumcised hearts, and so were God's people any better than the nations surrounding them? They were no better. As a matter of fact, they were, and we've read this earlier, they were worse because they knew better. They knew better. Too much is given, much is required, right? Yeah. Um, verses 17 to 22 of Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, let's read those. It says, Then the Lord says, Consider and call for the mourning women, that they may come and send for skillful wailing women, that they may come, let them make haste, take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run with tears and our eyelids gush with water, for a voice of wailing is heard from Zion. Here we are plundered, we are greatly ashamed because we have forsaken the land, because we have been cast out of our dwellings. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor a lamentation, for death has come through our windows." has entered our palaces to kill off the children, no longer to be outside, and the young men no longer on the streets. Speak, thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as refuse on the open field, like the cuttings after the harvester, and no one shall gather them. What's going on here? Has, has uh, Judah been ransacked yet by the Babylonians? Not quite. But Jeremiah is talking as if death has already come, and what's he calling for, for them to do? Call in the what? The mourners. Call in the mourners. Uh, when death entered a home uh, back in that day, mourners were hired to bewail the loss. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, it's sad enough when somebody passes away. But then to call in people who are just at the top of their lungs going to mourn and wail. But that's what they did. They emphasized their lamentations by dis- 
heveling, this heveling their hair and by renting their clothes. And Jeremiah here pitches the catastrophe to the nation that is coming, that he's warning about, as though it has already happened. And, uh, and suggests that the usual honors to the dead be carried out. Here's a question for us. Is it better, isn't it better to mourn on account of sin now than to mourn because of eternal loss later? Certainly is, isn't it? What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not necessarily mourning over the dead in that respect, and certainly we, we must, if, if a loved one passes away, we must mourn, but Jesus is talking about someone who is sorrowful of heart, recognizing that they've sinned against God and against somebody else, and they're repentant. And we'll talk a little bit more about repentance in just a little bit, but it is far better to mourn now because of sin and come to Jesus and seek forgiveness and healing than to mourn later because of eternal loss and ruin. Well, now we come to Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, the words of our Scripture text. Notice what it says again. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Powerful. Now, Jeremiah simply is pointing out the, uh, the pointless objects of self uh, confident boasting. Uh, he that glories, glory in this. The word glory is really the word boasting. If you're going to boast, don't boast in your might, your military prowess, your armaments, your strength of combatants. Don't, don't boast in your riches, wealth, and material possessions that constitute no legitimate ground for boasting. Because as the, the wise man says in Proverbs 23, verse 5, riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away, it's fleeting. But let him who boasts, let him boast in this. You see, the truly wise person, the truly wise person ascribes praise to God alone, never to self. The knowledge of God is the only true grounds for boasting, for in it is wrapped up eternal life. What did Jesus say in John 17 verse 3? He said uh, that they might come to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, me whom you have sent, and in this is life eternal. That's what Jesus said. That's my little paraphrase. But go back and read that, John 17, verse 3. This is life eternal, to know Jesus, to know the Father. So acknowledging God, knowing God, coming into an, an intimate, saving relationship with God is the basis of all true wisdom. You can be schooled, and you can have a college education. You could have two degrees. You could have a postgraduate degree. You could, have a, you could be a doctor, and those things are fine. But if, uh, if that's all you have, and if that's all a person has, and they don't know God, then they have nothing. They have nothing. They just simply have the, the praise of their classmates or their colleagues today and now. But when they grow old and they retire, they'll be lonely, and the knowledge will go to the ground with them. But if they have a knowledge of God, a saving relationship with Him, and they go, they go to the ground, they go to sleep, they die, then Jesus will wake them up, and they will know eternal life. Our relationship to God, according to these verses, has a reasonable, intelligent basis. Uh, the religion of Jesus is not merely an emotional religion. It is an intel intelligent religion, you see. But it's not just all head knowledge. We are to serve Him, according to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. We are to serve Him, yes, with the entire mind, but also with the entire what? Heart, with our entire being with our feelings, you see. So here's a question. Someone has for me Matthew 23, verse 37. Who's got that? Okay, Reuben, we're going to come to you in just a moment. Matthew 23 and verse 37. Here's the question. Does Jeremiah's heart ache for Judah in some way typify God's great love for us? Of course, you know the answer to that question, right? The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah's experience of weeping for his people uh, reminds us of Jesus' experience when he wept over Jerusalem. And uh, Reuben, you're going to read that for us. Matthew uh, 22, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus' heart broke for Jerusalem, didn't it? Just as Jeremiah's did, and you can understand that Jesus' heart broke even more 
and, um, and the exhibition on the cross when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, was, was, a, a, was a, uh, a declaration of a broken heart. The weight of the sin of the world crushed on Jesus, weighed on Jesus. And, and, uh, and of course, we know that sin separates us from God. And Jesus felt that God had fully departed and been separated from him, you see. I like the, what the lesson did. They shared a quote from the book Education, page 263. Ellen White says, Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our, our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not end, begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. Notice, the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that, from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. When there came up upon Israel the calamities that were the sure result of separation from God, subjugation by the enemy's cruelty and death, it is said his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And in all their afflictions, he was afflicted and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Isn't that a powerful statement? We need to gain a wider vision of God's incredible love for us and, the, and the, the pain that sin brings to his heart. You read something like this, you look at the cross and you say, I don't, want, I don't want to have anything to do with sin. I don't want to have anything to do with the departure from right. I don't want to have anything to do with deeds of cruelty or not to reach the ideal character that Christ is working in me to reach. That's what, uh, that's what a knowledge of the cross of Jesus brings to us. Amen? Surely. Well, let's look at Monday's lesson. Let's run over to Monday's lesson. Creatures or the Creator. We're going to go over to Jeremiah chapter 10. Time and time again, God warned Israel not to be shaped by the surrounding nations, not to adopt their wicked practices or it would not be well. God had called His ancient people to be different, to be special, not weird, but to be special from the nations around them. Someone had uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 can read that. Thank you, Rebecca. We're going to come to you in just a moment. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want to read a couple other verses for you here. God had always called His people special. Don't be conformed to what the uh, practices of the surrounding nations are. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. God said, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And then notice this in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. For you, he's talking to Israel, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Do you think God's people are to be special? Sure. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 26, verses 18 and 19. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed to you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations, which he has made in praise, in name and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Question is, were those, um, affirm the, those uh, affirmative statements to Israel of old, do they apply to us today? I certainly do. Rebecca, if you could read that first Peter chapter two verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. So God calls his people today, his children today, his church today, you and I, his special people, peculiar, special, not weird, peculiar. The world might consider us to be strange at times because we're, we adopt God's practices and principles and we're refusing to be conformed by uh, customs, traditions that are contrary to God's will in the world. But God considers us to be special, considers us to be His special people, holy nation. What, is this, what are these verses that I just read and that Rebecca read, what do these verses tell us about the power of pressure to conform? What do they tell us? There's a lot of pressure, isn't there? You know, we talk about peer pressure for teenagers and youth. Is there peer pressure for adults? And certainly there is. It doesn't just apply to young people. The, the pressure is there for each one of us to conform, you see, to the principles around us. The question is, why do some of us conform to those principles, to those practices? Do we violate our principles because we want to be accepted? Do we want to 
Uh, do we submit or succumb to those practices because the way just might seem a little easier? Because we forget perhaps the dangers of departure from right? Perhaps we're not totally loyal to Jesus Christ? Jeremiah chapter 10. Let's uh, read the first verses here. Notice the Bible says the word, hear the word that the Lord speaks to you. you notice, notice we've read in chapter 9 and chapter 10 uh, that little phrase, hear the word of the Lord, listen to God's voice, hear his word. It's, it's mentioned time and time again. Do you think God is trying to get the attention of his people? Surely. Uh, when, you, when we read uh, the, the New Testament, you go to the book of Revelation, over and over again you'll read there, he that has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, God wants us to hear, you see. Hear the word from the Lord. Verse 2, thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Don't go to those, don't go to those who do not have or know the truth about the true God. There's a warning in there for God's people today, even His remnant church. There are practices that other churches are practicing that are, that, are, that are bringing people to Jesus. That's fine, but we don't need to imitate practices that are contrary to God's will. We don't need to learn from people who don't have the truth. We need to learn from, from the Holy Word of God. And God has given His people a, the gift of prophecy, a special gift to His last day church to allow His church to dock in safely uh, into that harbor of eternity. Don't learn from the ways of the Gentiles. Don't be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, and the work of the hands of the workmen <clears throat> with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers, so that it will not topple. They're upright, like a palm tree. They cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. And as much as there is none like you, O Lord, or oh, let me just jump down, actually. Jump down to verse... I want to jump down to verse 8 and 9. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish, and a wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish, and the gold from Euphus, the, the work of the craftsman and of the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. What's the, what's the problem here? What is God addressing? God's addressing idol worship among God's people. God's people are uh, are conforming to the practices of the heathen around them. And uh, in these verses that we just read, the worthlessness of idols is forcefully demonstrated by highlighting the origin of the idols. The idols come from the hands of who? Man. It's interesting, there seems to be a little mocking in these verses. Did you notice that? Uh, it reminds me of Elijah. Speak up, talking to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Speak up, maybe your gods are sleeping. Maybe you need to speak louder. And uh, here, Jeremiah is saying, look, they need to be carried. They can't walk. They can't speak. Don't be afraid of them. They can't do anything. They're worthless. They're worthless. But by contrast, notice, I want you to notice these verses, verses 6 and 7. Notice the contrast. Worthless images made by man's hands, inanimate objects. Look at verse 6 and 7. He says, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Now jump over with me to verse 10. But the Lord is the, what, what God? The true God. And He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. Jump down to verse 12. He has made the earth by His power. He has established the world by His wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at His discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes a lightning for the rain, and he brings the wind out of his treasuries. And then we're going to jump down to verse 16. The portion of Jacob is not like them. He is what, friends? He is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And so, by contrast, God reveals himself as the creator of all things. He is, according to these verses, truth personified. God has life in Himself and He is the source of all that exists. His domain is unlimited. It's not hindered by space or time. God alone has the right to claim worship. And that right is based upon the fact that He is our Creator, that He is our Maker, 
God's continuous activity is seen in nature. Life around us reminds us that God is God and He is worthy of our worship. He's mentioned here in verse 10 as the living God. That phrase is mentioned in the King James Version about 30 times throughout Scripture and is often used to contrast the true God with the false gods. John said that, uh, interestingly, in, in Revelation chapter 7, John said that God is holding back the winds of strife until His servants are sealed with the seal of the living God, interestingly enough. So here's the question, has God given us a mechanism, has He got, given us something to remind us that He is Creator? Now, someone might immediately say He's given us the Word, sure. He's also given us creation, hasn't He? You look there in creation, you can't help but see the hand of a benevolent, intelligent designer, the Creator of all things. But has He given us something else? It happens every week, doesn't it? And the atheist, in spite of himself, passes over the seventh-day Sabbath every week, a reminder that God is the creator of all things. The seventh-day Sabbath is a reminder to us that God is the one who made all things and that He and He alone is worthy of our worship, our affections, our adoration. He is creator of all things. Thank God for the Sabbath. Thank God for the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is not just a reminder that God is God. He's, he's, he's the one who also can recreate our lives. He's the one who can make all things new, you see. And so God appeals here through Jeremiah to come back to the worship of the true God. And what's implied here is faithfulness, faithful observance to the Sabbath as well. Well, we've got to move along. Let's go to Tuesday. A call to repentance. A call to repentance. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 26 is a summary of the temple discourse given by Jeremiah, in, which is recorded in chapter 7 through 10 that I mentioned earlier. So chapter 26 is a summary of those four chapters. The reaction to the discourse by the people and the leaders and the final outcome of the entire incident are recorded only here in Jeremiah chapter 26. So let's look at verses 1 through 6. Uh, it says, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of jo Josiah. Now, you remember Jehoiakim was the first of the last three kings of Judah who came under subjection to the Babylonian powers. It was under Jehoiakim that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and took Daniel and his three friends and others back to Babylon, you see. So here uh, we're talking about Jehoiakim and that time. So in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah came, king of Judah. This word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house, speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command you to speak to them, do not diminish a word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil ways, that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evils of their doings. And they shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me, to walk in my law which I have set before you, to heed the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded. Then I will make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. This was serious. These were fighting words, essentially. These were fighting words. What was Shiloh? What was Shiloh? Shiloh was a town in the territory of Ephraim whose location is indicated in Judges chapter 21, verse 19. Its, a central, its central location made it a desirable place for the worship of God, for the sanctuary. And you can read that in Joshua 18, verse 1. Shiloh was the home of the ark for 300 years until it fell into the hands of the Philistines. And you can read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 4. That's when Eli was priest and he failed to check his son's misbehavior and because of that, wickedness and, and uh, evil practices spread throughout Israel at that time. And that was the time that Eli fell off the gate and broke his neck and died. Because of Israel's gross idolatry, God, according to Psalm 78 verse 60, forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. Uh, the Philistines captured the ark and presumably, presumably they, they destroyed the city at the same time. And so when Jeremiah came in and said, if you won't listen to the words I'm telling you, this place is going to be like Shiloh, they knew exactly what he was referring to. Did they like what he had to say? They didn't like what, they, what he had to say. As a matter of fact, the, the, uh, the prophet encourages them to turn away, uh, turn away from their evil ways. Another way of saying, repent. Repentance. What is repentance? Repentance acknowledges sin, there's a sorrow for it, there's a confession of it, 
and there's a turning away from it. That's what repentance involves. Repentance involves man, women, children humbling their hearts. But we need to remember that repentance doesn't debase a person. Repentance doesn't debase a person. Sin debases a person. Repentance restores the dignity of man. Repentance not only involves turning from sin, but it also leads to obedience to God's will and His law. So, Pat, the question, or questions. Repentance precedes forgiveness. Does that then mean that I must repent before I come to Christ, or is repentance in some way meritorious? Okay, that's a fair enough question. Now, God can only forgive somebody who is truly sorry, isn't that right? So, certainly, repentance does precede forgiveness. Um, however, that does not mean that I must repent before I come to Jesus. Some, sometimes people have a barrier between them and Jesus. They say, well, I haven't repented. I can't come to Jesus. Jesus says what? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. There's no condition, just come. And as we come to Jesus, what does he do? Acts 5.31, he gives us repentance, you see. And I think that answers the second question. Is repentance in some way meritorious? No, repentance is not meritorious at all. Because it's a gift from, from God, it's a gift from Jesus, that's right. I want us to look at a couple of verses, um, and someone has Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Isaiah 55, 7, Richard, thank you. And Richard, I think we have a brief question for you as well. It's a, I think it's pretty easy. Um, Luke chapter 24, verse 47, it says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so this was Jesus' commission to his disciples. What was the message they were to take to the world? It was a message of what? Repentance and a, and, a, and a message of remission of sins. So the message that God's people were to take to the world was a message of repentance. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commends men everywhere to repent. So there's a call. God is calling people to repent. It's not a scary word. It's just a word that simply describes a person's acknowledgement of sin, a sorrow for it, a confession of it, and a forsaking of it. That's what repentance is. And Richard, you've got Isaiah 55 verse 7. And when you've read that, can you ask this question, how precious is this promise to you and why? 55 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And to me, I put that up on the same level as I do with God's promise of eternal life. It lets me know that when my foot slips and I fall off that narrow path, that I'm not lost for eternity. That God, if I come to him with a repentant heart, will pick me up and put me back on that narrow path. That I'll still have that promise of eternal life. Amen. It reminds me of Paul when Paul said, why is it that I always do that which I don't want to do? Mm -hmm. And Paul was saying, I get up in the morning, I want to do good things, and at the end of the day, I did some things I didn't want to do, and we find in our lives we end up doing the same thing. But we have a God who's willing to forgive us if we come to him. Yeah, wash away our sins, right? That's the promise. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate that. Well, if you continue, we're going to go over to Wednesday's lesson. If you continue reading Jeremiah chapter 26, um, the response of the two parties which Jeremiah was especially sent to, and by the way, he, he belonged to those two groups. He was born into a priestly family, and he received the call of a prophet. And his message was directly for the priests and the prophets. Um, these individuals, what did they do? Did they like the message that Jeremiah gave them? What did they do? They threatened his life. Your life needs to be taken. You're not worthy to live. They didn't like the accusing voice of their conscience, and so they sought to silence forever the one who agitated it. Um, that, the, that the temple was to become like Shiloh was an unbearable thought, but God was still holding out an opportunity for them to repent. The people had, had placed their entire confidence in a strict observance of the outward religious services of the temple. And it's pretty ironic that they outwardly prided themselves in serving God, and yet they were conspiring in their hearts to kill a servant of God. Jesus, speaking of something similar in John chapter 8, verse 44, talked about the religious leaders of his day. And they said, we are the children of Abraham. You, you know, we don't even know what, who, your, who your real father is. We don't even know who your real father is. We are the children of Abraham. And what did Jesus say? You are of your father, the devil. Why? They prided themselves on their heritage, their religious heritage, but they were doing the works of the devil, you see. And this is what uh, was going on here in Jeremiah. Um, Bev, you're going to read for us Jeremiah chapter 26 verses 10 through 15, Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 10 through 15, and I think you can go ahead and read that for us now. When the princes of Judah heard these things, 
They came up from the king's house to the house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you have heard. Now therefore, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for the certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on the city and on the inhabitants of the city, on the inhabitants, for they have, for truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. Thanks, Bev. What was Jeremiah's response? They could do with him what they wanted to, mm -hmm. but to be for sure that they would be shedding innocent blood. Yeah, truly. Jeremiah stood his ground, didn't he? Yeah. He wasn't afraid to tell it like it was. Um, the, uh, the priests and the prophets appealed to civil power because they couldn't get their way. This was, they didn't, didn't really bring Jeremiah before a, uh, a regular court, which they should have done. They declared him guilty without fair trial. And if it wasn't for Jeremiah's courageous response, which was different from his prior whining and complaining and cursing the day he was born, um, which swung the balance of public opinion over in his favor, we would have a much shorter book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah would not have seen much further beyond that day, but he was courageous in his response. C confronting lies, confronting error and hypocrisy in the spirit of Jesus is a Christian thing to do. It is a Christian thing to do. If we don't stand for right now, how will people ever respect our witness and be led to God and to give God a try? There's a risk, of course, that comes with being faithful, but we are to leave the consequences in the Lord's hands. Jeremiah was faithful. In the, 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 the last verses of Jeremiah 26, and this is Thursday's lesson, the last verses of Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 16 to 24, Jeremiah escaped death. And uh, all the prince, princes of the people declared that Jeremiah was not worthy to die. They heard what he said and they, they summed it up. They said, okay, he's not worthy of death and not worthy of what, uh, what the priests and the prophets are saying. And then some elders, they stood up for Jeremiah and they reminded the priests and the prophets that when King Hezekiah and the people of Judah had heard the very strong message of Micah, the prophet, that they repented and the Lord held his judgment back. Now, apparently there's no written account of that experience, but it does accord with Hezekiah's character. The statement of the princes, the appeal of the elders and the support given by uh, Ahikam, Jeremiah was allowed to continue his ministry. Jeremiah was safe, at least for now. At least he was safe for now. I have a question I'm going to ask Ray. Um, I've got a question for you, Ray. You ready for the question? All right, very good. I hope you've got a microphone and we're ready to go. The question is, with the priests and the prophets conspiring against Jeremiah, what does this tell us to always be alert and listen carefully to and confirm what is said by religious and spiritual leaders by the Word of God? How careful do we have to be? I think that every teacher, every preacher, whenever they are giving their message, we should really compare it to with the Word of God. We cannot right away jump into conclusions that what they are saying is facts. We do have to compare their teaching and preaching with thus says the Lord. And then from there, raise uh, our foundation and belief in doctrines. So just, just because it comes from the, the mouth of a spiritual leader doesn't mean it's, it could all be right. This is what was happening right. in the days do of Jeremiah. We believe them all the time. Compare it with the Word of God, and if it coincides with the Word of God, mm -hmm. then it's truth. And if it isn't, if there's fault, you could t detect if there's falsehood in it. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're going to kind of be like the Bereans, right? Testing everything by the Word of God. That's, that's the call. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Here the elders and the people rose up to speak against the priests and the prophets. And um, it's important that we, and I'm not suggesting that you distrust me and the pastors here per se, but you do need to check and test that what's being said 
uh, is in fact from the Word of God, you see. Well, we've run out of time. It's been a great lesson and it's been a good one. God is, in this lesson, uh, the takeaway is that God is inviting each one of us to listen to Him, to hear His Word and His prophets. Listening, of course, not only involves hearing with our ears, but also applying the mind and the heart to do God's will. Anything short of this is superficial. Anything short of this will be extremely unhelpful to our Christian experience. And so the question is, won't you stop? Won't you listen? And won't you be willing to apply, ready to apply God's word to your life each and every day? I know I'm, I'm willing and I know you are as well. God bless you for that. And thank you that, uh, for those. Thank you to those of you who are joining us. Don't forget to call in for your free offer. It's offer number 21546. Call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. We're happy to get that free offer right out to you. Let us know how you're enjoying the programs. And we are looking forward to seeing you next week.